is, of course, Talking Pints, and joining me tonight is Rupert Allison. Rupert, good evening and cheers. Your very good health. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Now, you were a Conservative Member of Parliament for ten years. You went in in 1987, when I guess Margaret Thatcher was pretty much... It was the third election she'd won, pretty much at the height of her powers. And, and there you were, a sort of mid-30s... And there she was, stabbed in the back and abandoned by her own cabinet. Her backbenchers would have backed her, I think. How did you feel about her as leader? And I mean, was she impressive? Or was she, or was she... I mean, by 1990, was she coming towards the end? She was. I think the difficulty was that she was, became increasingly isolated and she surrounded herself with people who gave her, I think, very poor advice, including her PPS. But the difficulty was the election itself. And I remember how she was always very suspicious of me because I had taken an interest in the security and intelligence debates. And you'll remember the 1989 Security Service Act that I had advocated. And she was very suspicious. She, she didn't think that people had a, could have a legitimate interest in the intelligence community. She came round uh, eventually, but it, it was a while. And she was... She was very cautious about that whole subject because she'd been duffed up, if you remember, mm. when she first came to power in 1979. The first big issues were all intelligence failures, intelligence-related, Anthony Blunt in November 79, the Falklands War, classic failure of intelligence. So she was very nervous about the intelligence community and she was uh, slightly suspicious of me too, it's fair to say. But one issue on which you had very much common cause was Europe, or the EEC, which then turned into the EC, and then at the Maastricht Treaty turned into the EU. And you were one of those Maastricht rebels. I remember it all... I mean, I was in business at the time, but I was following the, the debate very, very closely. And indeed, the passing of that treaty is what directly got me involved in politics. I thought, well... But it was the end of my politics. Well, I because, remember. Because in the 97, I lost the Torbay parliamentary constituency by 12 votes. Yes. But it was UKIP that stood against me. Yes. And a delightful man, Graham, who was a, became a, a friend and had been a constituent, yes. he stood against me and I begged him. I said, you will, you're never going to win this seat. And by standing against me, uh, and he did get about 1,900 votes, uh, you will split my vote. I think that's right. I think in that case, UKIP did cost... Conservative votes. And, and, and what you we got in the end but, but, was an enthusiastic European. But, in the end, what UKIP did was to destroy the Labour Party. Absolutely. So, if you take the long view of this, yes, you yes. were a casualty. No, and no, I, and I, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm I happy to that. have been a, but a casualty. But you were a hero of mine, because when it came to the, the, the final vote, John Major couldn't get this through without, without the lowest trick in the book, using a motion of confidence debate. And all of them, Bill Cash and all the others who'd said it was the end of our independence, all traipsed in and voted for this treaty, which they'd advocated against. And Dennis Skinner, the Labour backbencher, shouted, it's a bloody good job you lot weren't here in 1940. And dramatic scenes. But there was one MP missing. <laughs> a certain member for Tor Bay, Rupert Allison. And I think you'd gone to New York with somebody for a long weekend, hadn't you? No, I, what happened was that I decided that <laughs> I was never going to be put in the position of the Prime Minister. And this is what John Major used to do. He, he would put his arm around you and push you through the, the wrong lobby. Now, because there were 15 others who said they were going to vote against the government in, on, the, in, the, in the motion of confidence, uh, I thought nobody's going to notice me, but I'm not prepared to be bullied by John Major and I'll just, I'll just stick it out and I won't actually attend... <laughs> and little did I know... And that you were in New York, weren't you? Uh, I was. With, and, and with a friend? No, 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 with, with my wife, as it well, happens. Okay. But, yeah. um, but it was the, the day beforehand, and uh, I could have come back, and uh, I decided not to. And Good for you. Well, Good for you. It, it created some difficulties, but, and I lost the whip, obviously, yeah. um, but it was restored to me. And that's why it made it so difficult for me in ninety seven. Yes to espouse uh, a UKIP position. Yeah. And I tried to explain that to Graham yeah. in Torbay, but, but uh, no. well, we are where I we say, are. As I say, in the end... I'm a battlefield casualty. You know, yeah, yeah, for a good I, cause. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that genuinely is right. But, Rupert, you're better known as Nigel West, 
you're better known, you know, that is your pen name. You've written book after book after book. You've written historical books about spy operations in World War II. You've written books about MI5, books about MI6. Are you the unofficial historian of British Secret Services? In a strange sort of way, yes. When I originally started working in the 1970s on the intelligence community, there was great hostility from MI5 and from SIS, and I was injuncted at one stage by the Attorney General. And the consequence of that was that I just was more interested in the community than ever, and I continued writing. And those books um, stand up rather well today, I think. But I'm continued to write in that particular field. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you've sold a lot of books and you've done pretty well out of it, I think. And, and you've had one or two legal cases and you've won some and lost some. And I mean, I know that's the way life is. But let's just talk about intelligence. I mean, was it the Cold War that got you into all of this? What, where, where was your interest? No, it was, the second, it was the Second World War and I was educated in a Benedictine monastery and one of the monks had taken holy orders after a lifetime in the intelligence community. Okay. And he used to tell us extraordinary stories. He'd escaped from a prison of war camp in Silesia, walked literally across Europe, across France, had got to um, Spain, then to Portugal, joined SIS. And he became a monk because he'd killed somebody and this had preyed on his conscience uh, forever afterwards. And he was a, a wonderful man. And his great friend in SIS, who used to visit the school driving down to Cornwall, was John le Carre. Oh. And so he would come and talk to us boys. And so there was a, a group of boys from that same monastery who went into the intelligence community. Uh, and one of them, Mark Allen, was responsible for negotiating um, with Colonel Gaddafi in Libya and uh, uh, negotiating the deal that gave United Nations access to all the chemical, biological and bacteriological sites in Libya. So there were yeah. several people who got involved in the intelligence yeah. community. And, and intelligence is always so important, isn't it? I mean, the massive row we've had over Iraq and whether the intelligence was right over that. And one wonders what intelligence Joe Biden had before he made this decision on Afghanistan. And I, well, it's well, I want to bring you right up to date and ask you, uh, you know, is this a big intelligence failure? It is in the sense that we are where we are. The difficulty is that people expect the intelligence community to predict the future. That's not what it's there for. It provides a snapshot of what is going on today and perhaps, as Colin Figures used to say, offers a sort of cat's eyes into the dark for the future and for guidance. But it, it's not there to tell you what to do. Options are given. But what was so shaming about Joe Biden and the decision to withdraw from Bagram is mm. that the Afghan National Army, the way that they fought and the way that they were taught was with an iPad. They would go out on patrol with a piece of intelligence that gave them real-time reconnaissance through drones overhead. They could call in airstrikes when they needed to. They could get on their devices the patrol area that they were going to visit they could see where the IEDs had been placed in the past two months. They had all the aerial reconnaissance. Overnight, they were stripped of that intelligence capability. So they were being asked to go out on patrol without any idea of what they were going to face, whether or not there was an ambush around the corner, which a drone hitherto had given them advance warning. So for Joe Biden to go on television and say that the Afghan National Army wasn't prepared to fight when the Americans had withdrawn from Bagram overnight yes. and taken away that air cover without warning anybody. And the that, was, army, that was wicked. And the Afghan army had taken, what, 45,000 casualties since 2014? Yeah. I mean, they were fighting damned hard. Yeah, um, and that brings me on to the other big subject of the day, China. The Chinese Communist Party, more specifically. I mean, when we talk about espionage... You know, we think I, think, I think Joe Public thinks in terms of the Cold War and Berlin and spy swaps and many of the things that you've written about in World War II that happened. Yet we don't think about China in general terms. Well, we should. Tell us why. We should. Partly because every business that enters into a partnership, any kind of commercial undertaking in the People's Republic, will have a relationship, whether they like it or not, with the Ministry of State Security. And the difficulty about 
looking at the MSS is that they do intelligence in a very different way. They don't um, pay many of their agents. They don't have stations or residenturas under diplomatic cover overseas. Uh, they run their agents in a very different kind of way using Guangxi, which is um, family obligation. They'll go to uh, ethnic Chinese, usually, invite them back to the People's Republic and then say that they've got an obligation to the Chinese people. So they, their recruitment methods are very different, but they pose a serious threat. Bear in mind that the longest and the deepest penetration of the CIA uh, over 32 years by the leading CIA China analyst was a man called Larry Wu Tai Chin. This was a Chinese case. It wasn't Soviet. It wasn't Russian. So when you're dealing with the Chinese, you're dealing with the government. And the government is there to represent and to protect the, the, uh, the, the, the Communist Party of the People's Republic of, of China. It's not about the Chinese people, it's about the Communist Party. Mm. And when you're dealing with <laughs> these people, you lose all proprietary information. They will steal everything because they think they're entitled to do so. And much of this, much of this intelligence that China wants to gather, as I understand it, isn't so much about military equipment or government strategy, important, though, of course, all that stuff, I'm sure, will be. But much of it is what I think we term industrial espionage. It, it, it's industrial espionage, it's commercial secrets, it's information shortcuts, uh, software... All of that is very attractive to the Ministry of State Security, which has a relationship with 300 university research centres in the People's Republic. So, again, when you think you're dealing with a legitimate company, you're not. You're dealing with MSS. When you're dealing with a university or a research centre, yeah. you're dealing with MSS. It, it's a very strange way of, of doing intelligence. And from... A Western perspective is not legitimate. Their priorities are the Uyghurs, Tib the Tibetan nationalists, um, the people who uh, uh, are involved in Falun Gong, which is this religious movement. It's a different movement. culture entirely, isn't it, at every level? It, it's like people who've never been to Russia appointing themselves Kremlinologists and pontificating about what's going on in the Kremlin without the slightest idea. And the same for China because it's so different the way they collect intelligence and the, the way that it's so fragmented and there are 750,000 students in North America who are uh, Chinese and all of them have a relationship wow. whether they like it or not with MS. This is what I, mean, I was thinking about this I mean you know our boarding schools in this country our private boarding schools are filled with uh, very high achieving academically high achieving Chinese students we see Universities like Cambridge taking very large endowments from Chinese organisations. I mean, is there a danger that this is a form of spying? Y yes, um, it, it, it's, it, it's cultural uh, appropriation mm. and it's commercial appropriation. But it's done on, a, on an industrial scale by MSS, who very often will recruit people. They pitch everybody. Instead of taking just one individual and concentrating mm. on that individual... They'll pitch 300 people and, really? the and they don't take no for an answer. They'll come back. There was a case in New York uh, where they had a sleeper for 21 years before they, uh, they pitched him again and again and again and mm. finally activated him. So they do intelligence in a very different way. And so it's, how, it's difficult for us to understand. How is it, Rupert? How is it that so many senior figures in this country and across the West... And I'm talking about former bosses of big companies. I'm talking about former senior civil servants. I'm talking um, about uh, many um, in the political world. Um, I noticed a link, actually, between those that were pro-Brussels who have now become pro-China. I genuinely do. Why did Boris Johnson think that Huawei were fit to play quite a major role in our telecoms industry? I, I, I can't speak for what went through his mind, but I think that it's fairly obvious that he took the view that they were there already and that we didn't mm. have the capability in this country of being able to run any kind of an organisation without Chinese components and, and participation. And if we'd gone to somebody else, it would have been a foreigner, it would have been probably two companies in Finland who were 
potential um, contenders yes. for this. Yes. And the difficulty there is that they <clears> might have been taken over by a foreign country. So uh, you deal with the devil that you, that you know. And we do understand the Chinese, and they have not made an attempt to run the kind of political campaigns and political espionage that they did in the United States, particularly during the, the Clinton era when they got mm -hmm. very badly burned in California. Yeah. So what next for Nigel West? Does, does he go on writing books about espionage? Uh, happily, the intelligence business is booming. <laughs> uh, and I think there is another entire book to be written about uh, intelligence failures and failures of strategy. Why didn't we keep Bagram? Uh, that, Why? That would have been... A... I mean, those hellish scenes outside Kabul, Bagram would have been very different, wouldn't it? I disapprove of people sitting in armchairs telling uh, the Taliban what people are likely to do, or, you know, just like in the Falklands yeah. campaign. Do you remember the admirals who were always on television explaining to Buenos Aires exactly what the next step was going to be? So yes. I don't think that we should talk about um, Afghanistan too much, except to say that it is a tragedy that we lost Bagram. It might have been possible to have an armoured corridor. It's, it's, what, uh, it's an hour and a half from Kabul to Bagram. Uh, it would have been possible. And mm. to leave our future in the hands of Joe Biden, and can I just remind you that when the Director of Central Intelligence, Bob Gates, was undergoing his um, confirmation hearing, he said that Joe Biden had been on the wrong side of every major foreign policy decision. And it was Joe Biden, by the way, who prevented the CIA from going after Osama bin Laden. I've been asking the question all evening of our public, is Joe Biden fit to be leader of the free world? I think you've just answered the question, haven't you? <laughs> I think it's one of the great tragedies. And if we go back in history, in 1956, during the Suez crisis, that was a moment when the American ambassador was withdrawn from London. It's the only time in our post-war history that that happened. And yet, during that period, although the relationship between Anthony Eden and mm. uh, Eisenhower and Nixon, who was running on a re-election yeah. campaign um, of, of peace and freedom. Uh, the idea that th this particular um, operation would compromise politics forever was nonsensical because all the Joint Intelligence Committee meetings during the Suez campaign, even though there was frostiness from Washington, they were all attended by Dan de la Bardlian, who was the CIA station chief in London. Yeah, that's and, crucial. And our attack on Egypt and destroying the, um, the Air Force on the morning of the uh, attack on Suez, that was all provided based on intelligence provided by U-2 aircraft flown by the CIA from British bases. Yeah, we need, that, rela we need that relationship, Rupert. We do. That was Rupert Allison on Talking Pints. We could have gone on for hours.